were going to the moon, or going back, we should say. That getting there part was figured out a long time ago, but what still remains unknown is any idea about how we might be able to stay there. Because when you factor that into the equation, it starts to make more sense why people stopped going to the moon in the first place. We can't keep spending millions of dollars and risking people's lives over and over again just to make day trips. The risk to reward ratio of a short duration trip to the lunar surface is not ideal. But if we apply that same equation to a long term stay where we can really make the most out of the trip, where we can stay long enough to learn something profound about the universe and life itself, something that we never could have discovered on Earth, then that is worth the money and it is worth the risk. But we can't do that kind of in depth research on the frontier of outer space without infrastructure. So we build on the moon. There's basically no point going back there if we don't intend to build something permanent, which leaves only the questions around what are we going to create up there? What will this moon base infrastructure do? And how does it work? That is what we are going to try and figure out today. This is the space race. Okay, let's start off with two general strategies that are happening right now in terms of moon base infrastructure. We have on one side the Artemis project, which is spearheaded by the United States and NASA, but is backed by pretty much every other space agency on Earth. In October 2020, NASA released a document they called the Artemis Accords, which is a very generalized guideline for how international efforts will cooperate on the surface of the moon. The main pillars of the agreement are to enhance a peaceful relationship between nations, to promote transparency in policy and planning, to maintain interoperability using international standards. There's also a very interesting section about preserving space heritage, by which they mean that no one can do anything that compromises the original NASA moon landing site. That's essentially the first space heritage site. And then lastly, they agree that space resources must be shared. There must be no harmful interference between national moon activities and the environment of the moon just be preserved with responsible disposal of spacecraft and of other equipment. So that's pretty cool. It's very kumbaya, super optimistic, Starfleet kind of vibes. But there's not very much of a concrete plan on what they're actually going to do or when they will do it. On the other side of the table is China and Russia. They are the only two major players that are not signed on to the Artemis Accords. I think China was not even allowed to sign on even if they wanted to. This is something called the Wolf Amendment that was written in 2011, and it's a measure prohibiting NASA from cooperating with China without the special approval of Congress. Russia chose not to sign on with the Artemis because, well, they're Russia. Anyway, China and Russia have made claims that they have plans to build on the moon within the next five years. The Chinese Space Agency is targeting 2027 for their first lunar research outpost. This would be an uncrewed station and would be deployed as part of the Chang'e 8's moon landing mission. This would be prior to any Chinese or Russian astronauts arriving on the moon, so the outpost would be constructed using robotics which will be really fascinating to see how it plays out. But as far as any details on the specifics of what that would look like or how it might work, we've got nothing so far. NASA haven't released any specifics about what they might build on the moon. And to be fair to them, they're really just laser focused on getting people there and back safely, which is more than enough to worry about. But SpaceX have thrown out some ideas about how we might be able to leverage their Starship as a more permanent facility. So given the plan right now, the Starship is only being used for the human landing system. This is like a ferry between lunar orbit and lunar surface. The Starship isn't responsible for getting people back home to Earth. The Orion spacecraft does that job. So once the lunar Starship has done its job, it can either just hang out in orbit around the moon or it can make one more trip back down to the surface and stay there. And if we have a SpaceX Starship on the surface of the moon, then we essentially have a nine meter diameter steel tube that's already been purpose built to sustain human life and act as a base of operations for two astronauts on their week long Artemis 3 moon mission. 
the plan from SpaceX is pretty basic. We just tip the Starship over and lay it down on the side. And then we cover it over with regolith, which is the fancy name for all of the dust and little bits of rock and stuff that cover the surface of the moon. So it would be like a low mound that would protect the ship from things like micrometeorites, radiation, solar flares, magnetic storms, all of the wild stuff out in space that the moon does not have enough atmosphere to shield us from. The airlock in the nose cone of the starship would serve like a big round front door, and the rest would basically just look like a hill. It's a hobbit hole, really. We're going to make hobbit holes on the moon. While most of the Artemis Accords are just fluffy, virtue signaling, unity stuff, there are a couple of sections with some weight to them, one of those being called Space Resources. Under this heading, NASA writes, the ability to extract and utilize resources on the moon, Mars, and asteroids will be critical to support safe and sustainable space exploration and development. The Artemis Accords reinforce that space resource extraction and utilization can and will be conducted under the auspices of the Outer Space Treaty with specific emphasis on Articles 2, 6, and 11. Okay, so now we've got to find where this is mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty. This is a document written up by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. If you didn't know that was a thing, it's a thing. So Artemis refers to Article 2 of this treaty, which says, Outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. I think that is trying to say that a nation on Earth cannot stake a claim to land on the moon. We couldn't show up, plant a flag, and declare this is now Moon Canada. Next up, Article 6 states, Parties to the treaty shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, and for assuring that national activities are carried out in conformity with the provisions set forth in the present treaty. The activities of non-governmental entities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. Couple interesting points there. It's basically saying that anything that a nation or national representatives do on the moon, they can still be held responsible for on Earth. And second, any non-government entity that can reach the moon, aka SpaceX, must have permission and supervision from NASA to carry out any activities there. Article 11 reads, in order to promote international cooperation in the peaceful exploration and use of outer space, states parties to the treaty conducting activities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, agree to inform the Secretary General of the United Nations, as well as the public and the international scientific community, to the greatest extent feasible and practicable of the nature, conduct, locations, and results of such activities. On receiving the said information, the Secretary General of the United Nations should be prepared to disseminate it immediately and effectively. Which I think says that if you find anything weird in space, like alien evidence, for example, then you've got to tell the UN and the public about it. No secret keeping. Not that bringing a whole lot of stuff back to Earth from the moon is going to be very useful anyway. As far as we can tell, there's nothing particularly valuable there that isn't readily available here. If the surface of the moon was covered in rare earth metals, that would be something else, but it's not. So we are mostly looking at in situ resources for moon based operations using local resources to support moon based infrastructure. We know that there are craters on the moon where the bottoms lie in perpetual darkness, never touched by light from the sun. So the temperature never rises above 60 degrees Kelvin, which is negative 213 degrees Celsius. These are also referred to as cold traps because elements that may have come along with the asteroids that made those craters, such as carbon dioxide, oxygen, hydrogen, and water, will remain in their solid form permanently and never escape as gas or vapor. So this is not confirmed yet, but it is very likely that the building blocks for breathable air, liquid water, and even methane fuel are all present on the moon in these cold traps. 
we figured out there are around 200 square kilometers of these particular crater bottoms on the moon, so there are plenty of options. One of the ways that we are currently looking at extracting those resources from the surface is something called molten regolith electrolysis. Sounds cool as hell, right? This is basically dissolving the regolith in a high temperature solvent to separate out the good stuff. We should be able to extract oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and titanium. So all of that is the stuff we are going to be doing in the short term. Artemis Accord nations are going to be living in starship hobbit holes, the Chinese and Russians will be doing whatever they're going to do in their robot base, and we're all going to be using in situ resources from the moon to stay alive. In the long term though, there are some pretty staggering possibilities that come out of building new infrastructure on the moon. We'll stick to just a couple of the really cool ones. A lunar solar power plant could literally save the world. So there's this wild idea called the lunar ring, which would involve wrapping the entire equator of the moon with solar panels. The lunar ring was first proposed by a Japanese construction company in the wake of the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. By wrapping around the entire circumference of the moon, at least half of the panels would always be lit by the sun, resulting in constant electrical production. And we are pretty sure that by using that molten regolith electrolysis system, we can actually extract all of the elements necessary to produce photovoltaic cells on the moon. We wouldn't even need to ship the solar panels from Earth. We could eventually manufacture them on location. The energy would then be beamed back to Earth using microwaves and lasers. I don't know if that's actually possible, but it sounds plausible at least, so we're pretty excited for that. Another really fun idea to think about building up there is an interstellar observatory on the far side of the moon. This is kind of the same idea as the James Webb Space Telescope. We could build the lunar observatory on the far side of the moon so that it would always be protected from radio interferences from Earth. And we could build in the bottom of one of these perpetually darkened craters so that heat from the sun would never affect the instruments they'd remain freezing cold just like the James Webb. And from that observatory on the far side of the moon, just imagine the kind of things we could see. It's generally accepted at this point that our ability to observe the universe from ground-based telescopes on Earth is only going to become more and more limited as the number of satellites and space stations and other stuff in low Earth orbit increases. And that number will increase by a lot very quickly. With all of these small rocket startups like Firefly and Rocket Lab and Virgin Orbit providing cheap and easy flights to orbit, plus once SpaceX gets their Starship program up and running with the capability to deliver hundreds of Starlink satellites per launch, if we're having a hard time seeing through the amount of stuff that's orbiting the planet right now, then it's going to be near impossible in just a few years. Now here is one last crazy idea. We all appreciate the value of an off-site backup when it comes to protecting data, right? Like even if you have your digital photos saved on three different hard drives around your house, that won't do you any good if the house burns down. You need to do an off-site backup if you wanna have true security. So why couldn't we do the same thing with very important things on Earth? Store them off-site, literally off-planet for extra safekeeping. And by important things, we mean the very essence of humanity, human DNA, you know, just in case. And while we're at it, we could go back up the genetic code for important food crops, key animals that we need for work like dogs, horses, and cows. We can make records of our mathematical formulas and scientific discoveries. All of it we can stash away somewhere safe under the surface of the moon. Then, even if us Earth-based humans can't survive our own cataclysm, even if we don't get the chance to start again, maybe somebody else will come along at some point over the next few billion years, and maybe those people, or whatever they happen to be, can at least learn something from everything that we've done. Anyway, let us know what you think about extending humanity to the moon. What do we build first, and what would you be the most excited to see happen up there? Drop your theories below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. 
Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.